As the countdown continued, with just over 1,200 days left to save the planet, the Supreme Master Qinghai International Association members in Taichung, Formosa, collaborated with 29 other co-organizers to host the climate change conference entitled Protect Our Home with Love on October 11. The letters L-O-V-E signify L for Low House, which stands for Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability, O for Organic, V for Vegan, and E for Eco Dimensions to Save the Planet. Thousands of participants attended the event to stay informed about the latest facts on global warming, ways to live sustainably, and the single most effective solution, the plant-based, animal-free diet. The conference was co-hosted by Thelmo Luis Buddy Kananan, the famous Philippine TV host of NBN Television. Discussions on the themes of love were conducted by distinguished panelists, including environmental scientist Dr. Leo Shaoshen and Professor Leo Chong Ming. Famous Formosan film and television personality, Ms. Tan Ai Chen. President of the Formosa's first veg promoting website, Mr. Lin Hong Roy. Chief editor of Persimmon Cultural Enterprise Company Limited, Mr. Lin Chu Wun Er. And former pig farmer turned vegan, Mr. Luo Hun Chin. Other dignitaries included guest speaker, the Honorable Mayor Amelita Navarro of Santiago, the Philippines, and Mr. Chen Tian Wen, Deputy Speaker of Taichung City Council. Graciously accepting an invitation to attend via video conference as the event's guest of honor was Supreme Master Ching Hai. We now invite you to join us for the video conference with Supreme Master Ching Hai entitled Protect Our Home with Love, held on October 11, 2009, Taichung, Formosa, or Taiwan. Greetings, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Climate Change Conference Protect Our Home with Love, which stands for LOHAS, Organic, Vegan, and Eco-Friendly. Greetings, too, to our worldwide viewers who are joining us today live through Supreme Master TV's 14 satellite platforms, IPTVs, cable TVs, and internet TV via www.suprememastertv.com. Let's care for this planet and protect the environment today through this conference. I'm your host, Buddy Kunana. Global warming and climate change have become serious worldwide concerns. The issue of climate is no longer just one day news event, but now has a serious impact on everyone's daily life. Yes, very true. You know, there are so many terrible, terrible disasters that have happened from the 2003 European heat wave to the 2004 South Asian tsunami to the 2005 Hurricane Katrina, to the 2008 cyclone Nargis in Myanmar, to the recurring wildfires in California and Australia, the terrible typhoon Speping and Ondoy that devastated Metro Manila and many parts of Northern Luzon. And of course, the disaster caused by Typhoon Morocco in Formosa, Taiwan this August and lately as well, Typhoon Parma, which did not land in Formosa, Taiwan, but caused a lot of disaster in Yilan, which made us feel like we are facing the climate change. Indeed, you know, disaster relief, making arrangements for refugees, victims of energy and food crises, collapsing ecological stability, international, regional, and local, cooperation. All of these are happening around us. Today, we are extremely honored to be able to invite many researchers and experts to join our conference. And through panel discussions, they will thoroughly explain the main causes and the effect of climate change and make concrete suggestions in four dimensions. 
Lohas Organic, Vegan, and Eco to address this global crisis. Yes, this conference is a product of so many groups and people coming together to protect the earth and protect the environment. And so, you know, we have 29 co-organizers who have helped make this conference happen. At this juncture, I'd like to say a special thanks to Chongqing University for providing Hoi Shen Hall, this beautiful place where we can come and meet and talk about this very pressing issue of climate change and global warming. Yes, it's really such a beautiful place. Now, we would like to invite Dr. Xiao Jiefu, the president of Zhongxin University, for his opening remarks. Hello,首先代表中兴大学,欢迎大家莅临中兴大学来参加这个非常有意义的会议。虽然这一次会议是用学术性的这个研讨会这个字眼,但实际上呢,整个这个会议经过精心的这个设计,能够让每一位来宾
That's right. Before starting the conference, we would like to introduce you a video about climate change. Now, please watch Practice the Way of Love to Halt the Climate Change. If you knew our home could be completely destroyed, or our lives are seriously threatened, would you let it continue going on? Now, as a result of climate change, uh, disasters uh, like uh, uh, not that unusual now. So we have to be prepared for the worst. And we are drafting a piece of legislation called Homeland Planning Act, which will divide the country into different regions. Some may have to be uh, evacuated, but this is very difficult in this country. We attach a lot of importance to the factor of global Warming. So you don't notice that there's a crisis, but in fact, we are at a crisis point now because we are very close to passing tipping points in the climate system that would have very undesirable consequences. There are a couple of individuals, very significant people, who have been making this report and looking very carefully at the numbers. And um, their conclusion now is that the contribution of livestock production to global warming is more than 60%. It's not the 18% which was first suggested three or four years ago. It's not even the 50 some percent suggested a short while ago. For past years, the livestock industry continues to expand. Where are the expanding lands and huge amount of grain coming from? Amazon deforestation increased 69% due to demand for meat during August 2007 and August 2008. The livestock sector is by far the single largest anthropogenic user of land. Deforestation is playing a major role in climate change. More than 300 experts stated, if we lose the forests, we lose the fight against climate change. A more urgent crisis is happening in the permafrost. Gases like methane are being released from the permafrost and the seafloor. As the gases will be released in huge quantities, the situation will be out of control. The permafrost layer is uh, melting each day, and the methane gas, or other gas even, are releasing into the atmosphere. Methane and nitrous oxide is made by livestock rising. Livestock skipping. They are far more poisonous, far more dangerous than CO2. Another gas implicated in several mass extinctions in the Earth's history is hydrogen sulfide. This colorless and highly toxic gas deadens our sense of smell and at higher concentration causes blindness and eventually death. Livestock and chemical fertilizers seriously pollute the water. People use targetless fishing trawlers, promptly destroying the ocean ecology. The ocean area lacking oxygen grows. Hydrogen sulfide then results in a dead zone. In the past, according to paleontologist Peter Ward, hydrogen sulfide in the oceans and atmosphere turned the sky green and choked off oxygen for plants, animals and marine life. He further warned that global warming caused by human activities could reproduce the same hydrogen sulfide situation that killed more than 90% of life during the Permian period. Our home is being destroyed and our lives are facing serious threats. 
We need to curb climate change. The point of no return is when you get to a place where the dynamics of the system takes over and then you can't do anything about it. It's too late. There are many things that people can do to reduce their carbon emissions, but changing your light bulb and many of the things are much less effective than changing your diet. Meat production and consumption is hugely intensive in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. Unless we change our food choices, nothing else matters because it is meat that is destroying most of our forests. It's meat that pollutes the waters. It is meat that is creating disease, which leads to all our money being diverted to hospitals. So um, it's the first choice for anybody who wants to save the earth. Then if you eat less meat, you will be healthier and so would the planet. There's where the climate problem is, our meat consumption. Earth, our one and only home. Earth nurses all life with love. It's time for us to be guardian of our Mother Earth, to protect our home and all the co-inhabitants with love. The lifestyle to love the Earth, called Lohas. Lohas, lifestyle of health and sustainability. You don't have to have a farm to do organic plants. You can plant tomatoes in pots on your balcony. You can put potatoes in them. You can have these shelf pots that you can plant all your herbs in. You can plant your lettuces. Try something, just experiment. In one of the longest studies ever conducted on organic farming practices, Research by the US-based Rodale Institute has found that organic soil management not only minimizes fossil fuel use, it can also reduce atmospheric carbon dioxide by removing it from the air and storing it as carbon in the soil. Scientists at the Institute estimate that if organic practices such as planting cover crops, composting and crop rotation were implemented on the planet's 3.5 billion tillable acres, nearly 40% of current CO2 emissions could be absorbed. It's good to plant trees that we can absorb some of the carbon dioxide. We've learned enough to know that the breeding of hundreds and thousands of animals for food is terribly damaging to the environment, so more and more people are eating less meat or no meat. I do what I do today as a hardcore vegan for the love of the animals. I know that no animal has to die for me to live. Just connect to the earth, feel the earth, feel the vibration of the sun, the sky, the clouds, everything around us run all the way through us and go right in through our feet to the heart of the earth. Please, for the sake of all the animals, be veg, go green, look at the flowers and save the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, this video is a reminder for all of us to respect and cherish lives and to halt climate change in order to preserve the beauty and the harmony of this planet. Yes, let's work together with love and change our daily life and attitudes so that we can end the crisis of global warming. Now, we have a special video greetings from important people around the world for this conference. Yes, first we have Dr. Rajendra K. Pachauri, the chairman of IPCC and the joint laureate of the Nobel Peace Prize 2007. Uh, let me at the outset convey my greetings to all you participants of this extremely important conference in Taichung, Taiwan. I'm deeply grieved 
at the terrible disaster that took place in Taiwan as a result of uh, the typhoon in Morocco. Uh, this obviously affected the lives and property of so many people and my deepest sympathies for those who lost their loved ones and who have lost all their belongings and possessions. Now, I really don't want to link any single incident, any weather-related event to human-induced climate change because that would be scientifically wrong. But I do want to emphasize that as a result of climate change, events like this are likely to increase not only in number and frequency, but also in magnitude and intensity. So I, I would like to appeal to all of you to spread the message across the world that we have to bring about major changes by which we can reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases. There is, of course, a lot that we can do in industry, in transport, and in every economic activity that human beings carried out. But what is going to be critically important is for us to change our value systems and to change our lifestyles. An important element of changes in lifestyles is to be able to alter our diets. Unfortunately, the world has gone into a pattern of excessive consumption of meat protein. And you find that wherever incomes go up, people start consuming more and more meat, more and more animal protein. Just to give you an example, uh, I, the first time I went to China was in 1981. And at that stage, about the only meat that people ate were, was pork uh, or, you know, some amount of poultry products. But today, with the increasing prosperity of China, you find a lot of people eating more and more meat. And China is not alone. This is happening in other parts of the world also. I find that even in India, which is essentially a vegetarian society, a great move towards eating much more meat, much more poultry products and so on. So we know that the emissions of greenhouse gases associated with the cycle of meat production, poultry production, and all forms of animal food that we consume uh, is extremely high. And one means by which we can reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases is to see that we cut down on meat consumption. And the result would be that not only would we be healthier, but so would the planet. It's now proved beyond doubt, medically as well, that those who live on a vegetarian diet certainly avoid some of the worst diseases that are now associated and are known to be associated with consumption of animal products, with poultry, and so on. So my submission would be that we should eat much less meat, and if possible, we should eliminate the consumption of red meat completely, because red meat, that's beef, lamb, mutton, uh, is associated with the highest levels of emissions of greenhouse gases of all forms of food. So if we really want to save the planet, if we want to live a healthy and contented life, I would like to submit that moving towards much lower consumption of meat would be the interests of human beings, and it certainly would be in the interests of the planet. So I would like to appeal to you to consider this carefully, and you would find that when you make such a move, that you'd actually feel much better. And my slogan is, if you eat less meat, you would be healthier, and so would the planet. I hope all of you will deliberate on all aspects of climate change, and particularly on the importance of bringing about lifestyle changes. So I hope you have a productive and very pleasant conference. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, for sharing for your loving concern for Taiwan and your dedication in saving this planet. Next, we have Mr. Philippe Roch, the former director of the Federal Environmental Office in Switzerland. Je suis Philippe Roch, ancien directeur de l'Office fédéral de l'environnement suisse, secrétaire d'État qui a participé à, pendant 13 ans à toutes les négociations internationales sur l'environnement. Nous allons traiter aujourd'hui des questions des changements climatiques et des droits humains, qui est une problématique extrêmement intéressante. Je me suis permis de rappeler aussi que si on veut assurer euh, le développement de, de tous et, et les droits humains pour, euh, pour tous, il faut bien sûr partager ce que nous avons. Il faut aussi cesser de gaspiller. 
Mais il ne faut pas non plus oublier celle qui nous donne toutes nos ressources, qui est la nature elle-même, les écosystèmes, qui subissent aujourd'hui des dommages extrêmes de surexploitation, de destruction des forêts, de la mer, etc. Et que, évidemment, pour partager les uns avec les autres, il faut avoir quelque chose à partager. Et c'est vraiment la, la nature qui nous donne tout ce dont nous avons besoin. Et il faut absolument que nous la respections comme notre mère. Alors, bien sûr que je suis très heureux d'apprendre que vous aurez une conférence vidéo sur l'environnement et dont le thème hein, est de protéger sa propre maison avec amour, hein, « Protect your home with love ». Et je pense que ça, c'est l'élément fondamental. Dès que nous avons compris que nous vivons dans une grande maison, tous ensemble, dans une grande famille, tous les humains et avec tous les êtres vivants, les animaux, les plantes, alors notre relation avec la planète change et nous la respectons et nous ne pouvons plus la détruire. Thank you, Mr. Philip Rock, for your encouraging words. Next, we will have Mr. Gepetto Natalina, the city councilman of São Paulo City, Brazil. Meu nome é Gilberto Natalini, sou médico, é, praticante da medicina e sou vereador da cidade de São Paulo pelo PSDB. Estou no meu terceiro mandato de vereador. É muito importante é, que se realizem conferências como essa pelo mundo, porque o momento é um momento muito difícil, muito complexo. A, a, o planeta Terra está passando por modificações muito graves nas suas questões climáticas. E é, eu quero desejar, então, aos participantes da conferência muito sucesso, um bom debate, que saiam propostas muito positivas para a melhoria das condições do planeta. O governo brasileiro está devendo para o mundo uma posição firme com respeito ao combate ao desmatamento da Amazônia e das nossas florestas. O crescimento do desmatamento das nossas florestas se deve, entre outras coisas, ao avanço da fronteira da agropecuária no Brasil. Isso significa destruição de floresta para a criação de gado, gado para se servir ao mercado. O que existe no Brasil é um desperdício de terra, é um desperdício de água na criação de gado para servir tanto ao mercado interno como ao mercado externo. Eu acredito que as medidas de sustentabilidade são indispensáveis, são fundamentais no mundo de hoje e trabalhamos muito para que isso exista na nossa cidade e no nosso país. Acredito também que a agricultura orgânica é um caminho muito importante, muito saudável para a proteção da saúde humana e também para a proteção do ecossistema, uma vez que os agrotóxicos são grandes destruidores, dá aqui um exemplo prático, é, 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 grandes bandos de marrecos na região, por exemplo, do norte fluminense, na Lagoa Feia, foram dizimados por uso de agrotóxicos em plantações no entorno da, da lagoa. E, por último, a questão do, do uso de vegetais na alimentação, né? o costume dos vegetarianos. Isso também pode ser uma medida extremamente importante, mas aí nós esbarramos nas questões culturais da humanidade de povos de vários países do mundo que durante milênios se alimentaram de, de carne animal e que é preciso haver todo um processo de educação, um processo de discussão para que as pessoas possam mudar de hábito. Eu quero pedir ao Dr. Pachauri e à Suprema Mestra para que se dedique, e tenho certeza que eles vão se dedicar, com todas as suas forças, para que esse encontro seja vitorioso. E quero pedir também para que todos os participantes do encontro vistam a camisa da sustentabilidade, da defesa do planeta e nos ajudem, particularmente nos países em desenvolvimento e nos países mais pobres, para que os, que os povos desses países possam superar a miséria, superar a pobreza e defender o planeta. É o nosso desejo sincero em nome da cidade de São Paulo, em nome do povo paulistano. Muito obrigado. and all the speakers again for your time and sincere efforts to halt climate change.
Many thanks to all our esteemed guests of this conference for sharing with us their great and exciting viewpoints. We're extremely fortunate today to have so many experts who will thoroughly explain to us the main causes and effects of climate change and make concrete suggestions of actions that can be taken. Yes, action now is very important. Our estimating experts have put lots of effort to study climate change and appealing to the people of the world to recognize the very real threat of global warming. First, we would like to introduce Dr. Liu Shaochen. Yes, Dr. Liu is currently the director of the Research Center for Environmental Changes, Academia Sinica. He is also the co-chairman of the Laboratory of Atmospheric Chemistry and Climate Change, Chinese Academy of Meteorological Sciences. He used to be the director of the Laboratory of Atmospheric Physics, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Join us in welcoming Dr. Liu Xiaochen. Thank you. Uh, Supreme Master Ching Hai, President Xiao Jie Fu, Honorable VIPs, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to share with you this afternoon about uh, one important uh, subject that is uh, global change and uh, the August 8 flooding by Typhoon Morak. Uh, global change or global warming is going to give us the kind of uh, environment to make August 8 disaster more often and worse. I think that message is extremely important. Global temperature increase is over the last uh, century about 0 0.6 degrees centigrade. And uh, also the global uh, ocean uh, surface rise about 15 centimeter. And the third is the snow cover has been decreasing. The increase of the global temperature and uh, also the sea surface rise is uh, relatively small over the last century. And uh, most people, I think, uh, would uh, have the perception that uh, the increase uh, is uh, gradual and uh, long term. But what they forgot to think is uh, together with global warming, we actually also have a uh, very urgent uh, change. That's the change to our extreme weather events. Significant increase in very heavy precipitation and also decrease in very light uh, rain has been occurring all over the, the world. We'll show you some example. Uh, even over the oceans, uh, the same thing has been happening. And uh, with the, the increase of uh, uh, very heavy precipitation comes uh, the increased risk of uh, flooding and also mudslides, just like the August 8 uh, uh, flooding uh, in southern Taiwan. And uh, also with uh, the decrease of uh, light rain, we all know that light rain is uh, very beneficial to the soil because uh, it's a very critical uh, source of uh, the soil moisture. And uh, by losing light uh, precipitation, we are increasing the risk of uh, drought. Despite the disaster of uh, flooding only two months ago, the drought situation in Taiwan in the last few years 
uh, have been very uh, severe and uh, very frequent. And that has to do with uh, the decrease of, uh, of uh, light rain in Taiwan. This figure shows uh, the change of uh, precipitation intensity in Taiwan. Uh, showing to the right, uh, these are very heavy precipitation. Here are very light precipitation. And different color means uh, the average of, of uh, every 10 years, uh, except the blue one is uh, the last five years. Uh, 2001 to 2005, and uh, years uh, 1961, 1970 is on top. You see light precipitation has been decreasing and heavy rains uh, increasing. This is the whole United States. You can see the same thing. The heavy precipitation are increasing. The light one, United States are different uh, uh, from, from Taiwan, the light one actually didn't show much uh, change. Uh, that's mostly because uh, in the U.S. in the last uh, 50 years or so, uh, the entire precipitation uh, has been increasing, while in Taiwan, the total precipitation has been uh, rather constant. This one is uh, for, for China, of course, you see. Uh, this shows uh, the, the linear trend of a uh, number of days of very light uh, rain, 0.1 millimeter per day. That's uh, uh, Chinese drizzles, or Chinese are called Mao Mao Yu, and um, blue means uh, decrease. And you can see over most uh, China has been decreasing. There are some exceptions, and over Taiwan, uh, we had the same thing, our uh, light drizzle, our, our Mao Mao Yu, decreased in the last uh, uh, 40, uh, 45 to 50 years. Uh, our Mao Mao Yu 50 years ago was uh, 70 days per year, but now we got only 35 days, a factor of two decrease in drizzles in Mao Mao Yu. That's a big loss of, uh, of uh, precipitation, particularly for places like Taichung and uh, further south. And in the spring, we need the light drizzles to give us uh, the, the uh, precipitation for the uh, spring planting. Um, researchers uh, in Academia Sinica in the last two years have been finding some very alarming changes uh, in heavy precipitation. Essentially, in the last uh, 50 years, we found uh, that uh, the top 10% very heavy precipitation increased uh, by almost a factor of two. So that's a large increase in 50 years. And corresponding to that, the light precipitation decreased uh, by Effect of two by 50 percent or so, and uh, that's a very large change for Taiwan. There are only four typhoons uh, in average each year landed uh, in Taiwan, and uh, Taiwan uh, have uh, about 40 percent of precipitation from typhoon. That means uh, most of the heavy precipitation are coming from typhoon in Taiwan, and um, in other words the very heavy typhoon precipitation in the last 50 years has increased by a factor of two. And you can imagine that really increased the flooding and the mudslide. We are predicting there will be more uh, strong precipitation associated with typhoon to Taiwan in the future years. In fact, we are predicting the next increase by another four, instead of by factor of two, the next one will be by factor of three. And the increase by another fold will take uh, not 50 years, only about 20 to 25 years. Because 
the increase in global temperature is going to speed up uh, in the next century, uh, essentially almost uh, doubling, in fact, uh, near the end, uh, tripling the rate of, for global temperature increase. Actually, we try to quantify the change uh, in the precipitation intensity uh, with uh, the global temperature. We divide uh, the intensity into 10 equal parts. So this is the top 10% precipitation, very strong precipitation, typhoons. And this is the light drizzles, the Mao Mao Yu. And you can see the strong, uh, heavy precipitation. For each degree increase in global temperature would increase by a factor of 1.4 or 140%. And uh, the light one would decrease by 70%. Now, this is uh, the IPCC's uh, prediction of uh, temperature increase in this century, okay, 21st century. And uh, the often mentioned uh, B1 case is the case uh, uh, that temperature would increase by a factor of two by the end of the uh, 21st century. And uh, that's when we try very hard to decrease the uh, greenhouse gas emission. We increase uh, temperature only by two degrees. If we don't try to limit uh, the, the greenhouse gas emission, we would get uh, the A2 case, that's uh, the pink one or this one. And uh, A2 case, the temperature increase is fairly close uh, uh, to, to four degrees. With the B2 case, because it is increased by two degrees, and each degree is 140%, two degrees means a 280% increase in heavy precipitation. And A2 case is four degrees, four times 140 is 560% increase in uh, precipitation, heavy precipitation. And that's uh, really alarming. I can't believe uh, living in that kind of environment. And that means uh, that uh, typhoons in Taiwan would bring three to five times more heavy precipitation. And uh, imagine that would be, mean at least uh, three to five times more flood and more mudslides. And uh, here I want to mentioned that uh, we should not uh, forget a decrease of light precipitation uh, because it's uh, in different season in Taiwan, as in winter and uh, spring, uh, the decrease of light precipitation will continue increase uh, the risk and the frequency of drought in Taiwan. Uh, this shows uh, for southern China is uh, the similar thing. Uh, the heavy one is not as much. It's 63 percent for each degree, and uh, that's about half of Taiwan. The pink one, you see, the global average, the heavy precipitation would increase by 110 percent, a little bit less than Taiwan, but uh, very large. And uh, these increases are going to be larger in the tropical region. And uh, that means uh, where a lot of uh, uh, precipitation already is going to increase more. And uh, also in places like uh, India in the summer, monsoon, they have uh, very heavy precipitation. Those uh, are going to get more uh, and uh, more frequent. So the place with uh, a lot of flooding is going to have increase, uh, but uh, where there's very little precipitation, uh, actually the drought is going to get worse. What we are saying is that uh, globally we are seeing the same thing. Very alarming change in heavy precipitation and light precipitation. And uh, the only way to stop these kind of disastrous change is to stop increasing greenhouse emissions. Thank you for your attention.
time for a speech. Thank and you very much, sir. We need more scientists like you to awaken people and make people understand the seriousness of climate change. Let's give him another round of applause, please. The next guest speaker is also an expert on climate change and another highly esteemed individual. He is Dr. Liu Chungming. Dr. Liu is the professor of the Department of Atmospheric Sciences and the director of the Global Change Research Center of National Taiwan University. Let's now warmly greet and welcome Dr. Liu Chungming. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really honored to be here. In the past uh, 10 to 15 years, I've been attending many different kinds of seminars, conferences, lectures, and so on. But today is uh, more than 1,000 audience. I've been, and I understand through broadcasting, it's probably like 100 million. I'm really honored to have this opportunity to talk about uh, what I've been doing in the past few years. Climate change is ongoing, and the global temperature keeps warming. It's actually uh, like a typo morag. People in Taiwan thinking it's very serious. Then probably next year, or the year after, we will have uh, another typo, probably breaking this year's record. So what we need is we need to adapt to the climate change. We have to live with it. We have to dance with it. We have to stay alive with the coming disasters. And uh, to have the way to do it, uh, it's not just uh, uh, personal, everyone, what we can do about it. We actually need the government. We need uh, people working together. So we need the law. We need to uh, establish this uh, National Climate Security Act. What I want to talk about is uh, Adaptation is to decrease climate vulnerability and to increase adaptation capacity. This is the uh, general temperature increasing trend in Taiwan, and there's a global trend. So uh, this is just saying that uh, we are uh, in the same warming trend as the world. This shows that the central part is climate change. Okay, This means that uh, the, the ongoing climate change composed of uh, a lot of uh, events uh, like temperature, increase, uh, heavy rainfall, and the sea level rise, everything. So it will have more hazards, disasters, and will uh, affect all primary industry like agriculture and so on. And uh, certainly will affect our ecosystem and human health, and we will uh, need uh, all people uh, concerned to be involved. We just saw the video sh showing that uh, our President Mao uh, has mentioned about uh, we will establish the national protection law. Uh, this is all included. So under the United Nations climate change framework, uh, we usually talk about this uh, mitigation. So we have like Kyoto Protocol, we uh, talk about to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, including the theme of today is uh, actually is uh, how to uh, reduce the emissions. But uh, the other thing is uh, adaptation, which means uh, we have to live with the climate change. So we have to do the impact assessment. We have to have a certain strategy uh, for the coming 100 years. We need to know how to live with it. Uh, so under UNFCCC, they actually have this uh, Nairobi work program for this uh, developed country and certainly for the least developed country. They all need to work on this subject. Uh, first of all, you need uh, scientists to work together to project the future climate change and to uh, assess like uh, uh, sea level rise. So Taiwan will probably lost uh, how much of land. So we probably have to uh, just uh, protect ourselves and we probably to live in, inward. And uh, also about this heavy rain, where if uh, uh, we can estimate that uh, how much frequency of the, this uh, heavy rain will increase and how much amount of water will come in. Then we we'll probably have to figure out, uh, like uh, for the mountain area, uh, could we have more people living there? I mean, all these uh, landslides, the more serious events will uh, come out. So 
what we should do with that. So that's actually a, a very difficult task. And this is uh, under UN uh, development program. They also have a strategy to do this, a similar concept. And uh, uh, definitely this, uh, for this uh, uh, coming disaster, we always have lost. So talk about adaptation is just to minimize the loss. So uh, in a simple wording is that uh, this year, uh, we have record-breaking rainfall. We also have record-breaking uh, uh, loss. But later, uh, for the coming years, we probably have another record-breaking rainfall and typhoon and so on. But we don't want to have another record-breaking uh, loss. How much we can benefit from doing this uh, adaptation task and uh, this is talking about uh, uh, worldwide, besides UN, each country. What do they do? They, are they doing on this uh, subject? Like uh, EU, Canada, Australia, Netherlands, and the United uh, Kingdom. Uh, UK actually passed the climate bill uh, to uh, tackle this issue. And uh, for developing countries like China, like India, they have uh, set up the initial program uh, to work on this. And certainly for these uh, least developed country or uh, small island developing uh, states, they are, are working on these subjects under UN guidance. And uh, currently in Taiwan, last year I've been working on this project, so we did a certain survey. And it uh, uh, seems that the most uh, people in Taiwan, they understand the, the current status of uh, climate change. They know the, the threat uh, to these uh, small islands, okay? And uh, the issue is, how can we uh, tackle this? For instance, uh, if another uh, type of rock coming, uh, do we construct uh, more, I mean, uh, like a high wall, so we protect ourselves uh, within it? I mean, the engineering approach probably will not work. So we need uh, something else. We need a non-engineering approach. However, talking about the adaptation, uh, people will say that, uh, well, once you adapt to the climate change, probably means that uh, we will not uh, be facing another serious typhoon. Actually not. We will still have a serious typhoon because the temperature warming, we have uh, a higher uh, temperature seawater, and it will help to intensify the intensity of this uh, typhoon, and also widen the typhoon inference area. The natural disaster still cannot be avoided, but we can hope to reduce the damage. That's the general per, uh, expectation we, we hope. Under this uh, general idea, last year, we proposed a framework on the national climate change impact assessment uh, adaptation strategy. We need the uh, legislature uh, adaption, industry and the land use adaption. So the president mentioned about national land protection law is actually one of it. It's just part of this uh, uh, general framework. This for coastal, that's a low-lying area, like uh, this year in Pindong, this uh, land subsistence area. The total population, I think, is close to uh, 50,000 people. So uh, we cannot just move them. We, just, we cannot just say you are not uh, suitable to live at this uh, subsistence area uh, with the sea level rise and land subsistence. This area is definitely the most vulnerable area in Taiwan. But we cannot just move them. We have to have a plan. We have to have a strategy to work on this issue and probably take 30 years to thoroughly move them. That is a long-term and a difficult task. Okay. So we need the legislation to pave the foundation for all the tasks. One simple act I propose is this Climate Security Act. Under this, the greenhouse gas emission is right here. With this greenhouse gas emission, uh, we have uh, a lot of interaction uh, going on. So actually, there's a lot of money uh, going through these uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. For instance, carbon tax, or may maybe these uh, cap and trade uh, activities, like emission trade and so on. It probably will get to uh, the general reduction of the greenhouse emission from this country. But from all this money flow, we can take out some of it into these uh, uh, three funds. One is called the Climate Security Fund which for each disaster like this year, a uh, government have to pour out a lot of money just for uh, rebuilding the uh, areas. And then the other is for minority funds, for those the most disadvantaged, the minority welfare. Another is for adaptation funds. So my 
general conclusion is based on the evidence of climate change is impact. Proper adaptation strategies are needed to sustain the future development of human system. A proposal for national climate change adaptation framework is addressed to facilitate adaptation capacity building in Taiwan. The Climate Security Act is waiting for positive response from regulators. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu, for your excellent speech. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we will be discussing other important issues later. But before that, let's watch a beautiful Aboriginal dance performance to remind us about the nature with harmony. Yes, here in Taiwan, there are over one dozen different Aboriginal tribes. And uh, today's performance, a very beautiful one, is by the Min Thai Aboriginal Dance Club, composed of high school boys and girls who practiced very long and very hard to present a very special dance number. Have you ever seen this before? No, no, but uh, in the Philippines, we also have many Aboriginal tribes, mm -hmm. and they're very similar to the ones you have in Taiwan. So this is something that Philippines and Taiwanese share, the Aboriginal links. And today's dance is actually three special dances that are now merged in one, called the Mountain Forest Shaken Dance. So let's all extend a hand of friendship to our Aboriginal brothers and sisters by giving them a warm <laughs> round of applause.
Yes, what a wonderful performance. I almost want to join them. You know, this is a beautiful example of the beauty of ancient traditions and the need for all of us to preserve these for generations to come. Now, many thanks to the Min Thai Aboriginal Dance Club, whose members are actually members of Taiwan's indigenous tribes as well. Yeah, do you know Ego is a holy bird of Aboriginal? No, no. I saw some of them dancing kind of like an eagle dance. Yeah. So every was... boy, every boy has been taught to learn the spirit of the uh, male Ego. Yeah. How interesting, mm. how interesting. And it was one of the three themes of the dance. The first was harvest, the second youth, and the third power of nature. We have a special video greeting for all of you from Miss Liv Cleveland. She is the information director of the Norwegian Animal Protection Alliance, who will share with all of us the need for humankind to coexist with nature. Greetings to all of you who participate at the conference. Um, this is Liv Cleveland. I work for the Norwegian Animal Protection Alliance as a lawyer and I'm working to try to give animals the rights that they deserve in our society. I'm a vegan and that's because of the animals and also because of the environment. Uh, in our society, animals are kept in factory farms where they have no possibilities at all to live like what they are made for. Um, young babies are taken from their mothers. Uh, mutilations uh, are common. Uh, the animals are fed intensively. Uh, many of them never see sunlight. They are kept indoors all their lives. Uh, and they are transported to slaughter uh, in thousands, in millions. So the animals are forced to live in a way that um, is detrimental to their health and welfare. And that is a major reason for me not to eat the meat. Also, I don't eat meat because of the environment. Um, meat production is actually one um, important reason for why our climate is changing so rapidly. To stop to eat meat is something that everyone can do um, to help stop the changes in the climate. And a lot of the energy in that plant food is lost in the animal to keep the animal alive and as manure from the animal. So it's much better to eat the plants directly um, because then you'll use less energy than if you eat meat. So one way to fight world hunger is actually to eat less meat. Animals are in many ways like us. Stop to eat meat. I think everyone that has been so lucky as to get to know an animal as an individual knows that an animal like a dog or a cow or a pig or even a hen is a person. I wish a lot of luck uh, to the conference Protect Our Home with Love in Taichung, Formosa. And I hope that everyone who participates will extend their love to animals. Be wed, go green to save our planet. Please leave Cleveland. You are so touched by your love for this earth and animals. Yes, it's truly very inspiring. And uh, that is also one of our next topics, to live in harmony with nature. Everyone knows our theme, love, or L-O-V-E, and we hope that all of us can live simple, healthy, and of course, vegan lives. Our next speaker is someone most of you are familiar with, Ms. Tan Ai Chen. She is a true animal lover who has rescued many stray cats and dogs and beleaguered animals. A famous movie and TV actress, Ms. Tan is also a vegetarian cooking show host. Let's warmly welcome Ms. Tan Ai Chen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. 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 
，每一天有一到两种不同的素食的料理，那么总共也已经有两千多种。谁说吃素没有变化呢？对不对？啊、哦，<笑>谢谢。那么我吃素呢，有二十一年的时间呢，哈。那么吃素呢，真的很好，那可以让我们身体健康，变得更有耐力，也当然会变得比较年轻。还好我现在五十六岁，看起来不像六十五哈，就是吃素给我们的这个最大的好处。呃，很多人会问我，你为什么会吃素？那么在中国，如果说吃素都会跟宗教有关系，因为是在佛教系统里面不杀生延伸出来的慈悲行为。但是我吃素是因为我舍不得吃小动物，跟宗教一点关系都没有。事实上，我是生长在基督徒的家庭，那么我是一个基督徒。那么我结婚以后，我的公公婆婆也是虔诚的基督徒，所以我在没有这个吃素之前，我没有听过佛教这两个字。反而因为吃素才认识了这个宗教，那么也因为呢认识了这个佛教，我才知道原来佛教里面有一句话叫做“有情众生”，就是表示动物跟我们的人一样，就是有七情六欲，我们会喜欢会害怕，他们也会有喜欢也会有害怕。那么它跟我们人类一样，有爱情、有亲情，还有友情，甚至于还有长幼有序的伦理观。那么，对于青海无上师说过的一句话，我感同身受。他说呢，有很多动物的品格比人类还要高贵。那么你实际上跟动物相处过，你才知道。那么我们想要让大家看一下哈，我今天呢，因为时间有限，很让我会吃素的这些小动物的照片跟大家分享，友情众生。好，那么这个是我当年我收养的流浪狗，有超过六十只，要集合在一起拍照不容易哈，所以呢，只能少数的集合。那么。这也是其中的一部分。如果你想只有狗，那就错了。其中有一只什么？啊，有一只混在里面，他以为他是狗。为什么？因为你看，他对狗非常的热情，他会去跟他亲亲啊。他一直以为他是这只母狗生的，而且他很聪明。我六十多只狗，很多都是流浪狗。我们这只小猪叫菲利啊。那么他一进门就认定了这一只我们全家最漂亮的那个叫做 Queen， 他就一直以为他是 Queen 生的小孩。那么有一次让他看到猪啊，他居然惨叫，因为他没有看过世界上有只动物。那，然后呢？好，那么人家说他是迷你猪，那么他非常的 nice， 对狗很好，那对人当然也没有话说。只要我一坐下来，他一定爬上来要亲亲。他非常的热情，当一个猪用鼻子一直亲你的时候，其实呢也是蛮蛮奇怪的哈。那么这只猪呢，它非常的聪明。当时我养它的时候，人家跟我说它是迷你猪，哈，迷你猪就变这样了。那还好，木栅动物园觉得它有教育的价值，所以收容了它。它进了木栅动物园以后呢，它就更不迷你了，它躺在那边，只会吃。但是呢，如果你们说猪是笨猪的话呢，我必须要平反啊、哦。那么，在这个送到木栅动物园两年之后，我有空我去看它的时候呢，我只是在旁边说：“菲利，妈妈来了，妈妈来摸小脸。”他一听到摸小脸，他就马上站起来，因为呢，他最喜欢把他的大猪头让我来摸，他自以为他还是小脸，所以呢。我一摸他，他马上就站起来。人家就说他怎么会认得你？我说当然哦，因为他是我儿子嘛。哈，所以他两年之后还认得妈妈的声音。所以你说猪是笨猪，那真的是冤枉他们了。那么如果你想我只有养狗跟猪的话，可能就错了。这些狗呢，都是我曾经饲养过的。这是獒犬啊、哦，大家都知道獒犬会吃人，对不对？很凶，但是呢，事实上呢，我从他的身上印证到，因为我每天放佛经给他听，然后让他听佛号，不到不到半年，他不但不会咬人，他甚至于可以让邻居不认识的小孩每天牵着他出去散步。好，所以说呢，其实动物跟人一样，经过教育跟这个影响，它是可以改变心性的。哈，这些动物都其实是跟。呃，不可思议的佛法有关，这些都是瞎眼的狗啊，那也是我那个时候捡来的。好，那么大家看到的这是一只什么？松鼠
那么他是被妈妈遗弃，他掉在草堆里面的时候呢，大概只有不到十公分，那么眼睛还没有张开，然后我用针筒，然后用米浆一点一点的把它喂养长大，那么。长大到了七个月的时候，因为我养动物我不会关，我就放养，让它在院子里面。那么它居然趁着我不在家的时候，带着她的男朋友回来，是一只长得非常英俊的大松鼠。那么每一天呢，它把它自己吃的食物吃完之后，都会留一两颗葡萄，偷偷的咬着带到围墙外面给她男朋友吃。那以后我就会帮她准备 double 两份，然后她自己吃饱了再带给她的男朋友。可是每一天她都是这个样子，跟她出去谈恋爱，然后晚上回来睡觉。可是慢慢的她就不回来睡觉了。那么，但是她每天还是回来会咬食物出去给她男朋友，因为我一定会帮她准备了一份。那么到了八个月大的时候呢？他居然有一天开始，他也不回来吃东西了。我非常着急，我就打电话问这个木栅动物园的兽医。他了解了这个情况之后，再问我他几个月大，我说八个月大，他就直接跟我说了一句话：“恭喜你做阿妈。<笑>”所以你说他们有没有爱情？有，我非常恭喜他有这样子的一个归宿哈。好，我们再来看下面，他像不像我生的？跟我长得好像哈。<笑>那个时候呢？因为很可惜的是，在二十几年前，我们台湾没有动物保护法，那么也没有野生动物中途之家，所以那个时候台湾的人呢，非常喜欢养野生动物来做这个宠物。那么有的时候是弃养，有的时候是没有办法养。所以我那个时候有一个非常多事的老公，他都会说我老婆会养，所以他就把他带回家，所以我才会有这样子的经历哈，跟这些动物相处。那么当然。你只要跟他相处，他就是把你当做自己的妈妈一样看待。来，我们再看下一张。好，这是一只什么飞鼠？飞鼠也是因为他出生以后，他的妈妈不愿意喂他奶，他的主人也不会养他，所以呢，我把他一点一点的养大，到最后我还要教他怎么飞，因为他以为他是狗，他是用脚在地上走路。那么我们就在想说，飞鼠在森林里面最怕什么？老鹰，对不对？可是我们家的飞鼠跟老鹰可以共同相处。来，我们再看下一张。好，这是我那个时候收养的一只台湾凤头苍鹰，这是我那时候收养的一只猫头鹰。哈，你看在森林里面，他们互相会说你是我的食物。好，那另外一个会说你不要吃我。可是，在我们家呢，他们都和平相处。他们每天都会站在衣柜上面呢，然后看着我们。那他们最喜欢共同做的一件事情，就是站在椅背上看着窗户外面的狗。这就是他们每天例行做的事情。这只大老鹰，它也是我那时候收养的一只小鹰。它为什么看我的嘴巴？你们知道吗？因为鸟都是用嘴巴喂孩子，对不对？它把我当妈妈，我只要回家，它一听到我开门的声音，它就在里面一直大叫。然后它每天都要看我的嘴巴有没有食物，所以我也会故意放一点食物用嘴巴喂它吃，让让它感受一下这个亲子的这个感觉哈。好，这是一对鹅，在他们身上，这一对鹅爸爸、鹅妈妈的身上呢，我看到了他们那一种没有办法这个去形容的一种爱情，还有。父母子女的亲情，好，他真的深深的让我感动。希望将来有这个机会跟大家分享这些小动物的故事。你们说蛇认不认得人？好，跟你们说，冷血动物，但是它也认得人。当我们靠近鱼缸的时候，你每天喂的鱼，它是不是会靠近你？当不认识的人，是不是会游开？对不对？所以说，冷血动物它同样认得人。他当然认得，因为他在我的身上都非常的觉得舒服哈。好，这是我去采访一只黑金刚猩猩，它关在一个笼子里面，我进去里面采访它。那么曾经有个动物叫顽皮家族，对不对？好，那么他们说我是搏命演出，可是呢，我非常的难过。因为在这只金刚猩猩的眼睛当中，我看到了是一个非常悲伤母亲的眼神。因为我们大家都知道，野生动物被关在动物园里面，被迫离开它的家人。但是它有没有感情？有，它跟我们人类一样是有亲情的。所以说，永远忘不了那一副感伤的神情。所以说，我们要爱护动物，当然最直接的方法就是保护它。昨天有一个人跟我说。很多人抱着狗跟猫说我很爱动物，但是怎么舍得嘴巴说爱动物，但是嘴巴继续啃食动物的肉肉
，对不对？所以说呢，我们将心比心，动物跟我们一样是有情绪的，所以呢，我们不要让我们害怕的事情。加诸在他们身上的痛苦，所以这就是我吃素的原因。谢谢各位让我有机会分享，谢谢。Thank you, Miss Tan Ai Chen, for your very heartwarming and moving stories. Very inspiring. Thank you. Have you watched the Miss Tan's movies? Yes, since I was a little girl. You know, I think it's great that celebrities get involved in good causes because they're able to influence other people to do good deeds as well for nature, for the animals, and for yes. environment. Don't you think so? Yes, I totally agree, and I I love Mini Pigs because of her.、Uh, many people and most friend of mine are pay more attention on animals and the street cats and dogs. That's、yeah. great to know. Okay, our next speaker is Mr. Lin Hung Rei. Who is the president of Swiss, the first website promoting vegetarianism in Formosa? So let's all welcome Mr. Lin. Uh, 各位先进午安。呃，今天很荣幸来到这里跟大家分享，呃，做如何做一个自在的素食者。那。呃，首先呢，我跟各位分享一下我吃素的经验。我从吃素开始到现在，总共十三年。那一开始吃素的原因呢，我想一开始也是因为从一些教育当中让我了解到，原来动物跟我们人是一样的。也从这里开始呢，我从高中时代就开始学习吃素。虽然看起来很年轻，有时候我已经快四十岁啊、呃。很多人说啊，你现在你您现在看起来很年轻哦，其实。呃，是吃素的关系。那，呃，从以前到现在，我觉得说，经过整个素食环境的演变，从早期我们吃素是非常困难。我记得以前在吃素的时候，我最好的伙伴就是饭有蒸菇一罐，然后，然后或者是什么什么香松一罐，加上一碗白饭，呃，这个就是我的午餐，甚至是晚餐。呃，那当然，托这样的一个饮食习惯之之福啊。我那时候体重只有五十九公斤啊，那结果呃，经过这几年的素食的演变啊，跟进展以后啊，我发现说现在在台湾吃素是非常幸福，呃、啊，不管是呃最简单的我们平淡的素食也好，或者是豪华的，或者是各种各国各式的料理都有，尤其呢，我们这个同修在台湾呃开了好几家的拉比哈。哦，真的是非常的造福我们素食朋友，也给大家热烈鼓励一下。<笑>那我想在我们先前的几个演讲当中，我们知道地球暖化已经造成我们环境的变化非常严重。呃，我们才不久的八八风灾，呃，以及前一阵子的呃台风，都造成非常大的伤害。于是呢，我们开始发心，我们要开始吃素。我们开始要从每日的饮食当中开始呢，降低我们肉食的一个比例。每个人都会说，干嘛要吃素？吃素有什么好？对不对？每一个人都有一个终极目标在那边。那我们呢，试着放下心去对待每一个人。也许他们暂时还是不能了解我们的苦心，可是呢，我们不用太过积极的去刺激他。我们只要呢。随时偶尔，又给他们一些事实的真相，比如说我们三先前所听到的一个博士的演讲，以及我们在 Super Master TV 所看到的一些讯息，我们偶尔丢一些讯息给他，偶尔丢一些讯息给他，渐渐渐渐的，他们就会去了解。呃，我简单举个例子来讲，呃，我个人的爸爸早期是非常反对我吃素，那我采取的方式呢，我不是以他去争辩。我还是吃我的素啊、哦，那那爸爸呢？他每次反对，我总会证明给他看，他的理论是错的啊、哦。比如说吃素不营养，我就吃的胖胖壮壮给他看。他说吃素呢，呃，会不结婚，我就结婚给他看。啊、哦，一一再的去呃解决他的困惑。渐渐呢，我们家的聚餐从素食是里面的一小菜一小菜开始，渐渐呢变成一半一半，半桌素半桌荤啊。哦再过来，最近这几年变成了
，吃素的是一大桌啊。<笑>那我我爸爸的朋友呢，他每次来消遣，他说啊，你你养这儿子啊，怎么这吃素啊，没男人味啊，怎么样？那我爸爸反而最近哦，会开始反驳那些朋友。你说哪有？你看吃的这么帅，那这么年轻<笑>啊！所以呢，我觉得说，我们当我们在走这条路的时候，一定会面临很多的疑难，很多的挫折。但是呢，我们要坚定我们的理想，我们的信心。再过来呢，我们对自己内心来讲，也要保持的一个弹性。比如说，我们前一阵子在推行每周一吃素这件事情，那你可以从他每周一开始来。下手说：“哎，来周一来，我们教你大家来吃素。那给他一个话题，给他一个方向，慢慢的去引导他。那借由这样的引导过程当中，他在学习当中发现他还有哪些观念不足，哪些的观念不是很清楚的时候，我们呢就适时的给他一些引导，给他一些方向，告诉他正确的吃素的观念是怎么样。那我觉得说，在我们一个。”引导别人吃素的过程当中，我们最重要、最重要是啊，与人和谐，这样子呢，你才能让他知道说，原来吃素是这么好的一件事情，是这么快乐的一件事情，是这么轻松的一件事情。当我们跟他相处的机会、跟他碰面的机会，都是我们播下素食种子的一个机会。你不晓得他随时什么时候会发芽、长大，但是呢，总有一天他会开始成长。他会在这个心里面开始有这样的感觉，这样的认识。原来我们有不同的饮食习惯可以选择，我们有不同的方式去改变我们的世界。啊，这个是我们最好的一个方向。谢谢各位给我这个机会，谢谢。Thank you very much, Mr. Lin Feng Rei. Our next speaker is Mr. Lin Xu Wen Er. He is the chief editor of Persimmon Books. Which is the leading vegetarian book publisher in Formosa? They published the Chinese version of *The Mad Cowboy* by Mr. Howard Lyman and the China Study by Dr. T. Collins Campbell. Let's welcome Mr. Lin Xu Wenner. Hello, ladies 你把大自然当成一个人就可以了，你不用要求你把它当成神或者什么。我想大自然其实是一个好人，他给我们四季，他给我们一个一个你可以预测的时间，什么时候会有春天、秋天、夏天，他会随着季节来。但是偶尔他像人一样，他也会有一点脾气，所以他有的时候他会给你一点幽默感。你要你可能准备要去盛装赴会的时候，他给你一点下雨，然后你可能就是淋的落汤鸡。但是过了一会，可能天气又好了。它其实是照着时间来，你如果顺着它的时间来做的时候，其实你所得到的大自然的庇护是非常的多的。那但是现在的世界好像不是这样子。中国话有一句叫做“天人合一”，啊，这是一个非常好的一个境界。但是，如果我们真的体验到“天人合一”这个事情的话，我想应该不会有人愿意伤害大自然，因为伤伤害大自然等于就伤害自己。但是。实际上面，我们又是常常在做伤害自己的事情，所以其实这么好的一句话，我们其实并没有做到。所以我觉得，对待大自然的第一个原则，只要你把它当做人，人需要尊重，人需要你去爱它，你需要去呵护它。所以其实如果可以用这样的心情去面对大自然，你不用太复杂的道理，也不用太大的哲学，其实你就会知道我该怎么去亲近它这样子。那如何亲近大自然里面呢？刚刚讲了一个原则，那我认为有三个步骤可以做。第一个步骤就是说，先不要去急着认识大自然是什么东西，我们应该先去认识说我到底是什么东西，认识我们自己本身最重要的是什么东西。那什么是我们生命中最值得珍惜的？有的人可能会谈说，可能是爱情，那也可能是金钱。但是其实在这里面，所有的命题里面，如果没有生命本身，其实。后面的爱情或金钱其实都没有任何的意义，所以我觉得第一个是要先认清楚，说大自然真的你认为它对你很重要吗？如果你真的认为它很重要的时候，你就自然就不会伤害它。但是因为大家都距离它太远了，所以未必会真的会这样子去认知这样子。所以我觉得，如果当我们真的认识到这一点，我们才有可能真的认识到说我的生存跟大自然是结合在一起的时候，你才会开始正视这个问题。那第二步是什么呢？
，我认识到说大自然真的对我很重要的时候，其实我们因为跟他距离又很远，所以我们需要开始学习。我常常看到说有一些父母，或是年纪比较长的。他们可能会想要急的急于教育小孩子，可能要学钢琴，然后学一些别的东西。但是其实真正应该受教育的，应该是我们自己本身，就是我们自己可能对大自然也都不是很认识这样。所以，我们以我们大人的这个角色，我们反而应该要重新学习，到底我们是不是真的认识他？那认识他最好的最好的学习方式，就是向你的小孩子学习。你如果去观察小孩子，那大概四五岁的这种小孩子，他可能才牙牙学语，你会发觉说小孩子对大自然是不会有惧怕的，他会去摸狗，甚至会去摸可能你认为比较害怕的蛇啦、蜥蜴的。但是我们反而会看到这些东西会害怕。有一次我在公园里面有一个小孩子，他看到一个所谓的攀木蜥蜴，他就过去去想要去跟他阿妈讲说：“阿妈阿妈，那边有个攀木蜥蜴这样子。”他阿妈看到攀木蜥蜴之后，就立刻倒退了三步。就赶快把他叫回来，说那个是变色龙，你要赶快回来，他会咬你这样子。每个人看到大自然，他不认识的东西都会害怕。那如果说我们真的愿意回到一个赤子之心啊，去向你的小孩子学习说，人出生其实本来就不怕这个东西。如果他愿意这样子去去重新认识大自然的时候，其实他会发觉说，我们到底该吃什么东西这个问题，其实就出来了。不信的话，你去看小孩子啊，小孩子。小孩子，你给他一片橘子，一个苹果，他会吃的很愉快。但是你说一定要给他塞一个肉，或者给他吃一个虾子，他反而需要学习。那如果说你带小孩子去菜市场的时候，你去看他说，他会停留在一个蔬菜水果摊的时间久一点，还是他经过杀鸡的，或是鹅摊，或是猪肉摊，他会停留比较久。所有食物的味道，其实就已经告诉我们说，小孩子还有一个人，他出生的时候，他本来就是趋近于。有颜色的、漂亮的，但是肉本身其实就是红色的或是白色的，它没有像大自然的水果那么多的面貌。所以我觉得，如果说我们诚心的回到像小孩子的心态去观察的时候，我们该吃什么东西，其实它是一个很明确的答案。这样，那如果说我们跟大自然共处里面呢，我可能还可以再提一个观念，就是大自然其实跟我们像是谈恋爱一样，我们其实跟它要的太多。那但是在谈恋爱的同时呢，我们当然有时候会要，有时候会给，所以呢，保持的还蛮不错的，还蛮平衡的。但是人类对大自然要的太多了。那恋爱的人本身呢，如果说要的太多的时候，会有什么情况？可能这个男方或者是这个女方可能会翻脸。所以当他们要分手的时候呢，有好一点的可能聊一聊就算了。但是大自然，如果你跟大自然不好好相处，它其实跟你谈恋爱的状况是一模一样，它可能就是。给你一个，给你一个暴风雨，或是明天给你一个莫名其妙的地方下雪，然后没事给你摇一下，来一个地震。那如果你不好好跟他相处，其实跟大自然翻脸的后果，其实是比恋人翻脸的后果是更恐怖的。好，我觉得到了第三步，应该是一个，当我们觉醒的时候，觉得说大自然很重要，然后从我们的生命中学习到大自然对我们的启发之后，接下来我觉得我们应该要的就是付出。因为唯一只有付出的时候，你才能够再得到。那我们谈恋爱的状况也是一样，你不可能跟你的男朋友或女朋友一直要东西，你一定也要付出。那所谓的付出就是牺牲啊。那父母对小孩子的爱本来就有一点牺牲啊，他一定要牺牲他的时间来照顾他。那我们跟大自然的情况也是一样啊，我们需要牺牲我们的口腹之欲，因为这实在太难了。所以唯一只有一个，只有一个字可以让。这个人愿意改变他的行为，那就是今天我们活动的主题，就是爱。唯一只有爱可以让一个人愿意牺牲，所以我们需要检视来说，我到底对于大自然是不是有这么的热爱它？如果你了解这样的生存对我们来讲是性命攸关的事情的时候，我相信你会觉得这一点点牺牲其实一点都不算是什么。所以我今天在这里就是分享说，我认为。在大自然里面，我们应该要怎么样到最后去付出我们的实践？那这个是我们人类的希望所在。那今天就演讲到这边，谢谢。Thank you, thank you, Mr. Lin Shi, for your beautiful message.
本身是养猪户，我现在转为素食。然后这场研研讨会对我来说意义非常的重大。哎，我希望利用我小小的一个故事，可以就是让还正在从事畜牧业养殖的人，还没吃素的人，可以看到我这样子的改变，跟着我一起改变。呃，以素食的这个方式来改变整个暖化现象，不管是从医学的角度，还是说从从大气的角度来看，它是目前最可行的方式。那我认为就是直接从每一个人的三餐着手，它立刻就可以改变整个的食物链，从农业一直影响到畜牧业这样子。那所以这个方式，我认为是现在以及未来的主流。那以无上师的世界会所推广的这个方向，绝对是对暖化。全世界的暖化还有气候变迁的改善有绝大的效益。我想提倡这个素食哈，我们一定要不遗余力了。那今天的这个研讨会哈，我是很希望能够让大家能够注重，能够开始做这个吃素食的啊这个准备哈。假如说还没开始的话，今天是一个好开始。开始的话。应当是更加倍去努力。那个全球的暖化的确是一个非常危险，它影响非常大的一个问题。那减低温室气体啊，几乎是唯一的，就是说能减少全球暖化影响的办法。我觉得不分国籍、不分宗教、不分团体、不分政党，大家有志一同，就是为了自己的身体健康，也为了地球环保。我们应该要用舒适来救地球